All right, here's a story, a story. Um, <clears throat> all right, I'll go on. Reb Mordechai of Nadvorna. Reb Mordechai of Nadvorna. This is a story made 100 years ago. Reb Mordechai of Nadvorna, a very holy person. Now, Nadvorna, I don't know where it is. I guess maybe it's in like in Poland or something like that. In any case, the religious Jews kept as far away from the non-Jews as possible. As well, when they had to do business, they did business. You know, they were accepted as a group. You know, uh, but nevertheless, they tried not to have any interaction because you could never tell when anti-Semitism would flare up and the, the court systems over there were clearly, you know, prejudiced in favor of the non-Jew. Let's say Navorna is in Poland. And so it was a bit surprising. All there was all the pupils of the Rebbe of Navorna were waiting for a train. And suddenly a lady started to scream, Where is my purse? My purse. I, 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 I've been pickpocketed. Somebody's told. And the Rebbe of Navorna said, <clears throat> Go and buy a, a, a ticket, a train ticket for that lady and also give her some money. So the, their train was supposed to be coming in another like 10 minutes or whatever. It wasn't much time. So the boy did what the Rebbe said, what the Rebbe of the Nadborna said. And he ran to the, to, to the ticket office and he bought a ticket and he ran and he gave it to this lady. And the lady said, what is this? He said, I, I bought you a ticket. I heard that you said you lost your wall, your the thing and your, the, and your money. And I have mercy on you. And why should you be here, you know, stranded? It's bad enough you lost your money. And here I bought you a ticket. And here's also some, some money for spending money. You can buy something. She said, oh, thank you. She was just so amazed. Thank you. And the train came. And he ran back to the Rebbe, and she got on the train. That's the end of it. So we couldn't understand exactly why, what the point of the whole business was. And there was always, you know, the, the suspicion that maybe people would say, ah, he probably stole it. That's so why he's giving it back. And they got it. In any case, whatever happened, the whole the thing was forgotten. <clears throat> the whole business was forgotten. And and this young man, he got married, had a family, had children. <clears throat> and somehow or other, some non-Jews accused him of some sort of a crime, of embezzling from the government. And they, they brought him to a pre-trial. And the pre-trial, they found that he was suspected of all the charges. And there was waiting for him a sentence in jail, like 60 years in jail, which a Jew being in jail for like, you know, a couple of hours, that was pretty much the end. <clears throat> so he didn't know what to do. So he posted bond. He was, he was a fairly wealthy man. He posted bond and he went and he got lawyers and no lawyer wanted to take his case. No lawyer wanted to, to represent him. The evidence was against him. These people had produced more false witnesses, and they they and they uh, they changed some some of the papers, and they whatever they forged papers saying that he he didn't pay his his taxes, that he earned more money than he declared. Whatever. So there was only one ch chance, he had only one chance, and that was to to go to the judge was going to provide, preside over the case. This judge that was going to preside over the case was an anti-Semite. Uh, as were permit pretty much all the Polish people, you know, to various degrees. And, you know, he, uh, <clears throat> but he had no other choice. So he went to the town and <clears throat> to the town where this judge was, where the judge lived. And uh, he all of a sudden got another idea. Instead of talking to the judge, 
he would talk to the judge's wife, which the judge was like a rabid anti-Semite, and he was, you know, very outspoken about how he hated the Jews and all this. But his wife was also, you know, anti-Semite, but nothing like him, nothing like the judge. So he decided what he's going to do is, is he'll, he found that the judge's wife likes embroidered things, embroidered things. So he went to the market and he looked around and he has also a little bit of an artistic sense. And he went, spent the whole day at the market and he found some sort of embroidered tablecloth. It was really exquisite and it cost a lot of money and he bought it. And he figured he'd give it to a, if he was caught trying to bribe a judge, that would only make things worse. But he had no other choice. He had no choice. So he went to their house when he was, he went to the house of this judge and he knocked on the door and he prayed to God that his wife would answer the door. And sure enough, his wife answered the door. And he said, I'd like to present you with this, with this gift. And I would like you just to please hear me out. She, she said, who are you? What is this? And she looked at him and she gave a scream and she fainted. And he took a couple of steps back. He figured, wow, this is really going to be bad. They'll think that I attacked the, the judge's wife. The judge came running and said, what is this? What is this Jew? What are you doing? He says, your honor, I don't know. And she just look, took a look at me and she fainted. He immediately took his wife, are you all right? The servants came, they brought water, and she looks, and she said, it's him, it's him. <clears throat> and he said, what do you mean it's him? She, he says, uh, remember I told you that I was at the train station 15 years ago, and there was a young boy, a young man with a face like an angel, and he gave me a ticket. Well, this is him. He has the same face as that boy. He's same. He says, come in, come in. He said, what, what is your story? He tells him the whole story. He says, listen, I'm innocent. I didn't do anything. I came here. I wanted to bribe your wife. I wanted to give. And then what she's saying, I don't need any bribe. You helped me so much. The judge says, um, you really did it. Huh? You really helped my wife. Why did you do it? Why did you help my wife back there? He said, I saw she was in a terrible situation. And I had mercy on her. And then, you know, my, my rabbi had mercy on her also. And she... So he said, okay, listen, I'm going to send investigators, detectives, to investigate this whole thing, and I'll see <clears throat> what really the truth is. If the truth is as you say, then you're free. No, if the truth is not as you say, then it's going to be sin on sin. You try to bribe and et cetera. Of course, he sent the investigators, and they discovered that it was true, that what he said was the truth. In other words, sometimes one of the jobs of tzaddikim is to benefit people in any way possible, even if it means a matter of seeing in the future. Because by truth, tzaddikim, the future and the present is really one in the same. Have a good day with Mashiach. Now, God willing, tomorrow we'll continue learning the Kuti Torah and the Malchut at 8.15 in the morning. Shalom, Obrach. I have a good day with Mashiach now. Thank you.